Hi guys, in this video we will be understanding the characteristics of the urban climate and learning about the urban heat island, finishing off with an exam style question. Before we have a look at the urban heat island effect, I'm first going to give you a brief introduction to the urban climate. So urban areas tend to have their own climate and their own weather systems, or this can be called a microclimate. And this is also sometimes referred to as a climatic dome, as it tends to have a dome shape, which we'll look at later on. And within this climatic dome, the weather is different to the surrounding areas, typically the rural areas. So the urban climatic dome will typically have its own set of humidity levels, precipitation, wind and air qualities, which are different from the surrounding rural areas. And for a large city, the dome may extend upwards for around 200 to 300 metres. And typically the dome will be larger depending on how large the city is. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the actual structure of the urban dome. And the urban dome has two levels within it. So below the roof level, we have what's called the urban canopy, which is here where we can see all these buildings. And this is where processes are acting in the spaces between the buildings. And these are sometimes called canyons. And above this, we have the urban boundary layer here, which is above the canopy layer. And the dome will then extend downwind as the height and the plume is blown into the surrounding areas. So the dome would typically be around in this area here. This would be our dome. But because of the direction of the wind, the wind then blows some of these climatic conditions further downwind across here. So we see the effect of the urban climatic dome further on outside the city in the direction of the wind. But overall, you can see that there's a difference between the rural areas surrounding the city and we have our climatic dome, which is in the suburbs and the urban areas, with the highest point of the dome being right over the centre of the city. So now we're going to look at the urban heat island effect in relation to temperature. So urban and suburban areas experience higher temperatures than the surrounding rural areas, which I mentioned earlier on in the video. And this is what constitutes the urban heat island effect, that the cities are warmer than the rural areas. And we can see this in this diagram that I showed you earlier, that we have temperatures which are rising in this plume across and over the suburban and the urban areas, whilst the rural areas on the outskirts of the city are much cooler. And this is why annual mean temperatures in cities can be one to three degrees warmer than rural areas. And now we're going to go on to look at some of the causes for this as well. We can also see this on this graph here where we have temperature levels for a city region and we can see on the x-axis down here the type of area. So we have our primary downtown urban area in the middle and we can see that this correlates with the highest peak temperatures here whilst our rural areas are much cooler. And we can also see that this is reflected in this park area here whilst it's in the city limits because of the park's presence it actually causes a drop in temperature and we're going to look at some of the reasons for this later on in the video. Another point to consider as well as this is that urban heat islands and their heat island profiles are going to be greater in the summer months rather than in the winter months because obviously it's hotter in the summer this will exacerbate the effect of the urban heat island during this season as well whilst it's going to be cooler in the winter too. But even in the winter, the urban area will be significantly warmer than the surrounding rural areas. Um, we can now look at this in relation to London's urban heat island. So this is a thermal diagram of London here. And we can see that the red areas correlate to higher temperatures, whilst the green areas correlate to the cooler temperatures, going from red all the way to green. And as we can see, the red areas correlate with the centre of London, whilst the green areas correlate to the surrounding rural areas, showing us and explaining London's urban heat island effect that the city is generally warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And we can see this correlates too to this satellite image here, where we see that our more built up areas here in the centre of London, where we have less green space, we end up with the higher temperatures here as well. But what's also interesting to notice here 
is that this little yellow spot here in the middle of London can also be seen here on this satellite image. And this is because this is a park space. And as I mentioned earlier on in the video, where we have parks within cities, this causes a little space where the temperatures are generally cooler. And now moving on to look at the causes for why cities are warmer than rural areas. This is primarily because of what we call the albedo effect. And this relates to how reflective surfaces are. So surfaces in cities tend to be made of tarmac and concrete and so on. And these are much darker and less reflective surfaces than the sort of surfaces we find in rural areas in the countryside, such as trees and lakes and rivers and so on, which are more reflective. So we say that surfaces in the city have a lower albedo and this means that they have a lower reflectivity. So less radiation is reflected back into the atmosphere and these sorts of surfaces such as tarmac absorb the heat and retain it rather than reflecting it back. So this can be explained in this diagram here where we have our whiter surfaces which have a high albedo and our lower albedo surfaces which are much darker. As you can see from the arrows, here we have our infrared insulation or radiation coming in. And as you can see, the white surface reflects more off it. So the whiter surfaces stay cooler, whilst the black surfaces, they absorb more radiation. And as you can see here, it's only 10% compared to 80% here is reflected back. And this means that these surfaces heat up. And this is why primarily urban spaces are much hotter, is because the surfaces are absorbing the heat. So it's really important to remember that this is what's called the albedo effect and that the city surfaces such as tarmac, as we can see here, have a lower albedo. Another factor though that can influence the reason why cities are warmer than rural areas is because of air pollution. And this typically comes from industry and vehicles. And because we have more industry and cars in cities, they create more pollution and this can create a pollution dome. And what this pollution does is that it allows in shortwave radiation into the dome, but then it absorbs a lot of it and it reflects it back to the surface and it essentially makes the city warmer. It acts as a blanket almost. You can think of it as a blanket. So the city area is already really hot already because of the albedo effect and air pollution essentially acts as a blanket and keeps it even warmer and insulates it. And finally, another reason why cities are warmer is because we have a lot of sewers and hard surfaces in cities. So water falling onto these surfaces are quickly disposed of into sewers and drains and canals and so on as quickly as possible. And this will change the urban moisture and heat budget that we find in cities. And it means that there's reduced evapotranspiration. So more energy is available to heat the atmosphere rather than heating the water because there's very little water in cities. And then also we also get excess heat coming from industries and buildings and vehicles, which are all burning fuels. So when these fuels are burnt, they generate heat and this adds to the heat in the city. And although we tend to regulate temperatures indoors through using air conditioning units, the air conditioning units, whilst they're making the atmosphere inside a room cooler, it's making the external atmosphere hotter because of the energy needed to generate this cooler air. So even people are themselves generating heat through the use of air conditioning and using their cars as well but also even big populations in cities are emitting heat themselves because humans are warm-blooded animals so we ourselves are emitting heat. So now looking at why the urban heat island is a matter of concern this is because considerable work has been done on the urban heat island effect in London in recent years and a number of different concerns have been highlighted through this research. So one of the main concerns to do with the urban heat islands is that as temperatures rise in the summer months especially, conditions in cities such as London can become so hot and uncomfortable, in, especially in buildings or in public transport systems as well. This extreme heat can cause many health effects, which are very negative. Extreme heat events can cause heat stroke, asthma, 
even organ damage and especially in very vulnerable groups such as babies and elderly people, it can also cause death. So that's one of the main issues is that the extreme temperatures that can occur in the summer will cause people to die. And then the second problem we have is that the hot and still anticyclonic weather conditions, which are responsible for the urban heat island effect that we can see in cities, produces itself higher air pollution levels. And this is because the chemical reactions that produce chemicals such as ozone, which is O3 in its chemical formula, and things like smog, which we'll be looking at in detail in later videos, are accelerated by these high temperatures in cities. And also the lower wind speeds that we have in cities as well tend to keep the heat and the pollution trapped within the city, which is very negative and can lead to continued pollution levels rising. Additionally, the urban heat island can end up putting more strain on energy supplies and water supplies as well. And this is because as cities get hotter and hotter, people are going to be using more air conditioning, for example, to cool down their homes and their offices and their businesses as well. And obviously it requires an energy supply to make air conditioning units work. And even though it's cooling the interior environment, air conditioning units therefore will start to heat the outside environment due to the fuel being burnt to fuel them. And this also places extra strain on water supply as well, and it can lead to water use restrictions, such as hose pipe bans, which we sometimes experience in the summer in many urban environments, especially in London. And this is because evaporation or transpiration rates will be higher in these city areas because it's hotter, so water is going to evaporate much faster, and it means that even the plants and the trees will be extracting more water from the soil at a greater rate than normal so it's going to leave our soils very dry. These hotter temperatures as well caused by the urban heat island will also lead to the prolonged survival and also higher reproduction rates of many insects and pests which we obviously don't like to have around and this can be really problematic in cities for the survival of pests like rats and mosquitoes and all sorts of bugs that we don't like because they grow better and they survive better in higher temperatures and it can also cause algal blooms in watercourses which can damage water ecosystems as well as a result of the rising temperatures. There's also an increased risk of chemical weathering occurring through processes such as acid rain and this is because the increased temperature changes cause chemical weathering and this can lead to the deterioration of historical monuments as well and buildings because acid rain will essentially dissolve them. And finally, climate change is expected to increase the intensity of the urban heat island effect in most urban areas and this is why it's really important that we consider some solutions to prevent the events that are occurring in cities as they get hotter and hotter and to try and prevent this temperature increase. So now we're going to move on to look at some of the strategies for managing the urban heat island effect. And in light of the largely negative consequences of this extreme heat that we find in cities that we just looked at, we can use specific types of urban planning and design to focus on strategies to reduce the effects of the urban heat island. So the first thing we can do is to increase the use of cool surfaces in cities. And in particular, a lot of architects now are building buildings with cool roofs built from materials with a high solar reflectance or a higher albedo. So they reflect more radiation than they absorb. And so they store less solar energy during the day. And this can be done by building roofs which are white or shiny materials rather than dark and matte materials. And we saw this in the previous video when we looked at the albedo effect and we saw that darker materials absorbed more light. Therefore, by using whiter and shiny materials, as we can see on this roof here, we're reflecting more heat back out into the atmosphere and this should help cool the city. The next strategy is very similar to the cool surfaces strategy and this is to use green roofs. And these green roofs consist of growing a medium such as grass planted over a waterproof membrane on a roof and this can help to reduce the temperatures on the rooftop by about 20 to 40 degrees on a sunny day. 
and in addition to uh, these roofs are really helpful for the environment as well because they reduce rainwater runoff, they act as insulators and they also increase urban biodiversity, bringing more plants and animals into the area and they provide a good habitat for birds and butterflies and other small animals as well. So green roofs are a very good option. Then we also have a strategy called urban greening, which we can see here, and it's pretty straightforward. And this is essentially planting more trees and vegetation in cities, because not only do they provide shade to the lower ground and stopping the pavements heating up as much, they also have a cooler effect because trees have a higher albedo than the dark surfaces that we normally find in cities. So they absorb less insulation and radiation, and they will essentially make the cities cooler. So urban trees as well can act as carbon stores and they can also act to reduce pollution in cities because they will reduce the amount of CO2 in the air and they can absorb the CO2 that's emitted from cars and from industry as well. So urban greening is a very good and sustainable strategy. We also have another strategy called the sky view factor. And Skyview describes the relative openness between buildings in an urban area, because a lot of the time, if we have very narrow streets and tall buildings, this will reduce the potential for the heat to escape back into the atmosphere. So as you can see here with this layout of London, with some very modern buildings, such as the Walkie Talkie building, all these buildings have different heights, different shapes. They're not all very clustered together. And this will allow the heat to escape more easily than having a very uniform set of buildings, all the same height um, and this very closely packed together. So this will help to distribute heat more evenly and stop specific areas heating up a lot. And then finally, from a more human perspective and not from a planning perspective, Using and buying lighter coloured cars can have a significant effect because buying a white or a cream or a silver coloured car can reflect more sunlight than traditional dark cars, cars that are black or blue um, can do. So this will cool the inside of the car and it will reduce the need for air conditioning as well. And obviously air conditioning has a negative effect on the environment because it consumes fuel so it's polluting and also using air conditioning generates heat as well so by using white cars buying white cars this can have a significant effect um, on the temperature and the pollution levels experienced in cities so finally we're going to answer an exam style question which relates to the last two videos and we're going to explain the formation of the urban heat island effect so the first thing I'm going to do to answer this question is to define what the urban heat island is. So I've said the urban heat island is the zone around and above an urban area which has a higher temperature than the surrounding rural area. So that's our basic definition. And then now what we're going to do for the rest of the answer is to expand on that and effectively describe how this situation and effect is created. So firstly, I've gone on to talk about how the urban heat island effect is caused in relation to the albedo effect. So I've said the urban heat island effect is primarily caused by the lower reflectivity of surfaces in urban areas, such as concrete and tarmac. These surfaces have a lower albedo, that's really important that we use these key technical words here, and thus they reflect less radiation back into the atmosphere, which increases average temperatures. Then I'm going to talk more about how pollution adds to this effect, stating that this issue is exacerbated by increased pollution levels in cities from burning fossil fuels in industry and vehicle use. Increased air pollution increases cloud cover, further reflecting radiation back to the surface. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, Join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-Level Geography a walk in the park.